Hi guys, I've brought you here today to get the industry specialists to answer all the questions that we've all been thinking about and we've all been talking about. So today we want to answer the questions about when do you think we're going back, what PPE do we need, what products have we got in place, do we need appointments? All of them subjects, I think I've got the right guys to cover. I've got Helen, that you might know her in the trade shows as the last woman at the bar, but she's the main guy from Andis, distributor, uh, Styling Products UK and Groomers. We've got AD from Booksy. You all know him from all the sh uh, shows and about, that's going to talk to you about appointments. We've got Gareth Clark, that's a barbershop owner for many, many years. It's going to talk to you about how he's thinking about going back and employment. And we've got Simon from Dapper Dan. He will um, correct me and say him, but I think si Dapper Dan is the leading barbershop selling brand at the moment. Am I right, Simon? UK brand. UK brand, yeah. So to me, that's the perfect five to ask all these questions that everyone keeps asking. So, you know, people were like guessing this, that and the other, but I thought, right, let's get the industry specialists in. And what I've done is I put together three questions for each of them that I'm <laughs> going to ask them so that we get to ask the right questions and get the right answers. So this is not live, but what we want to do is afterwards, when people can put their comments in, hopefully you guys will be okay with this. You're going to, you'll come in like I will and try and answer any other questions anyone else wants to ask. Is that all right? Yeah, cool. Yeah, ah, cool. Right, we'll start with Helen from Styling Products UK. I was uh, talking to Helen the other day about going back and PPE, but before we get on to our first question, can I just let Helen introduce herself? So, hi guys. Um, I've been with Styling Products UK for the last um, five years working alongside um, Andis, and also we have a, another company called Groomers, which do dog grooming. So from the point of view of um, PPE, it kind of sits quite nicely in two different places, to be honest. Okay. Right then, let's get straight on the questions, Helen. So we was talking the other day, and we said about the Danish laws and Norwegian laws of going back. What PPE have you started sourcing for styling products to sell to us barbers and why do you think we need that PPE? I think you can look at quite an extensive list and I think everyone will choose, unless it's regulated, everyone will choose little bits that they take away and little bits that they won't. Um, and I think timing will also be a point of what the barbers want to choose because obviously it's not regulated in the UK. But you're going to have to think of anything that comes into contact with um, personal skin needing to have some kind of protection or be single use. So you can look at the likes of gowns. We're either going to have to have disposable gowns or you're washing them each time or you're going to have to have something around the neck to stop them touching the customer's neck. Now, Mike and I were talking and going on to sort of neck papers being quite... Um, annoying to use I guess um, and the fact that they don't stick and they move and all of those little things and sometimes they're more hassle than they worth um, so I went and looked a little bit more of what could be on offer and as the barbering industry has been quite close to the dental industry we looked at um, high neck disposable bibs which would mean potentially you can put these inside a gown which would touch the customer's neck your gown would remain free of skin contact and they would be then disposable um, so that's one item that i don't think has been seen in the barbering world um, secondly we've looked at down to um, masks and also visors i think there's a lot of talk about will it be a mask or visor situation um, and again i think that's going to come down to personal um, choice at this moment in time. Obviously the mask is gonna protect you if you sneeze on anybody or uh, things like that, but also you've still got your eyes open um, to any uh, airborne virus droplets. So having a mask gives you double protection. So with the mask, we're looking at um, changeable shields so that you can change those shields. Um, and then lots of liquids, etc., to be able to um, clean your the likes of your clippers, your combs, and all things like that. Because I think, although, you know, I've certainly been into hairdressers lots, although um, you, you think those are clean, the combs and brushes, 
are they sanitized after every use? I don't think they are. So, you know, that's going to have to become, I think, very strict in making sure the cones are only used once and then sanitized. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't realize that it, for barbicide to work is 10 minutes. So you can't Absolutely. dip it in and then start using it again. And it's, it's the thing with the gowns that gets me because, say, a barbershop's got three barbers on a Saturday that do 20 haircuts each. That's 60 gowns. That's a lot mm -hmm. of washing gowns. So there's got to be something in place that we can use so we can use the same gown again. So, yeah. I, so I think, like you said about the neck strips, but like they do fall off or the tissue, the skin's still touching skin. There needs to be something that protects you, but the gown can be used again, I feel. Yeah. Otherwise, um, I mean, if there's too much PPE and too much regulator, it wouldn't be worth, it would cost too much to do a haircut. And, and that's what sort of worries me. So the other question I've got for you was in the Sun newspaper, last week we was going back on the 11th of May. And then this week, we're not going back for six months. The day after we're not going back for six months, clipper sales go through the roof. You can't get a pair of clippers for love nor money. So everyone's went out and bought their own clippers. Has us barbers got anything to fear, do you think? I don't think so. Um, and I, again, I turn it around to, to hairdressers really. Someone asked me the question and I would far rather go and have my hair cut than I would go to the pub right now. So if someone said I could do one thing, first thing I'd do is go and have my hair cut. And I think you'll find most people will say the same things. I honestly don't believe um, barbers have anything to fear. If you look at some of the atrocious pictures from home haircuts, um, I think you'll have things to fear from sorting out home haircuts um, and perhaps home dyeing. So I think you're going to have some atrocities walk in the door, but I don't think you'll have anything fear work-wise. I think of anything, you're probably going to think you're going to be busier. Yeah, I mean, I spoke to a mate the other day and he said to me, he was fearing it. And I said, well, are you drinking at home? And he said, yeah. And I said, so you're going to go to the pub after this? Yeah, well, of course cool, I am. Well, there you go. But you can have the same drink at home as you can in the pub. You can't have the same haircut. And I think we're the most industry that seems to be talked about. So I think we're going to be more appreciated, if anything. I, de you know, I definitely... I think your value will go up. Everyone will see your value a lot more. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think this is what I want to put out to people is don't lower your prices and don't panic. There's nothing to panic about. Everyone's talking about hair. They are going to be back in their droves like they are in other countries, in Denmark, for instance. They can't keep up with the demand at the moment. Yeah, I think it's going to be a different world we all emerge from, but I think um, there are some professions that their value is greater to us than we all appreciate it. Yeah, I agree. So the last question for you, Helen, before I let you go, is people are going to need styling products UK. I use you guys for my head blocks, my stands, for my students. How do they get an account with you to get this PPE? Okay, it's really simple. They can go on to our um, page, our Styling Products UK page and there's a contact us, they can drop us an email. Um, at that point, the emails will drop either to myself or one of my guys, and we'll ask a few questions about, are you trade? What sort of volumes are you looking to buy at? And we set you up as the right type of customer so that you can come in and buy either off the website or directly from um, telephone or email. Brilliant stuff. Well, I'll talk to you in a minute when we have our little group discussion at the end, but if I get on to AD, Thanks, Mike. Cheers, Helen. Thanks, Helen. Right then, Aid. We've known each other a while now, and Aidy was at me because our old-fashioned barber, walk-in system, about doing Booksy. But my new shop, I said, right, I'm going to do Booksy. And it's worked. And it's worked a hell of a treat. And with this happening, I'm going, all my shops are going over to Booksy. But we talk quite a bit, so I wanted to have this conversation so you could tell people about what's happening with Booksy and what you expect with the appointments. Can you introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, my name is Adrian Ward. Um, you can get me on uh, Adrian underscore Booksy on Instagram. And I sort of started Booksy about, it was in January 2016. Um, it was a Polish company originally. I'd worked um, previously with uh, the CEO, Stefan Battery, and uh, he decided that, you know, having opened up in Poland and in and the United States, that he wanted to open up in the UK. So that's how I got introduced to meeting all you lovely barbers <laughs> four, four and a half years ago. Um, in terms of, um, in those days, you probably could count on one hand any um, barber that was using appointments, you know? It was mostly really um, salons and, and stylists that would use the appointment system. Um, 
and obviously it's grown. I mean, in the last four or five years, you know, there's quite a few suppliers out there that are offering um, booking online services and using apps. So we've definitely seen a great improvement in terms of how easy it is for people to actually book. Um, I think the generation today is really very much, they, they're using apps like Uber, Deliveroo, and many others. So they're, they're pretty much okay with using apps for, for booking a service. Okay, yep. Right, I wanna, uh, we spoke the other day and you were telling me about an exciting thing about keeping in touch with your clients through Booksy. Yeah. You, first off, tell everyone about that, this idea you have. Yes, okay. Well, um, first of all, the, the, the barbers are keeping in touch with their, with their customers through push notification emails and there's different, you know, with, with the database so they can keep in touch on a regular basis. But I think with everything that's been going on, a lot of people are really going through that sort of first couple of weeks. My God, I can't believe this. Is this a dream? Is this for real? Is this really happening? And that's initial inertia of shock. Then people are sitting down and, and organizing and they're thinking the smart ones are, when, when business opens up, how is that going to change? And how is that going to affect my business? You know? So um, one of the things that our developers have been working very, very fast with is we've realized that a lot of customers go to their barbers, not just for the haircut. They go really, their barbers will be their therapists, with their priests. <laughs> you know, there's a whole host of reasons why people go to their barbers. And that communication is, is missing. The customers are missing that and the barbers are missing that. So um, we thought it'd be very good to actually work on, 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 on the app. And now we have uh, what we call the Zoom is integrated into the app. So barbers can set up a service, keep in touch with their customers, even if it's just 10, 15 minutes and how to groom and look after you here under lockdown. And to talk about other issues, you know, the, the normal things that you, you would, barbers would normally speak to with their customers sitting in a chair for half an hour, 45 minutes can continue. So we're very excited about that. And that's just been, been launched as we speak. So for the feedback from people I've spoken to in the UK, right over to the United States of America, is yes, that is something that they would like to engage with. And it sort of mentally prepares them also by keeping in touch with their customers that they're still here and, and to give advice and looking obviously from the time when, the, when business opens up so they can get back straight on it. Yeah, I mean, and it is that thing like we talk, talk about mental health, like a lot of people might live on their own and just want yes. to talk to like a familiar face. Yes, definitely. I think that communication is, um, I think before this happened, we, we, we've taken so many things for granted. And I think today now it's been a massive change in people's mind. How important it is that we actually do need each other more than we probably thought we do. And how important it is to have that exchange of energy. I, I'm looking at the last four or five years, I've seen barbers who will probably may not be at the top of their game. They're still learning, but they've got a great heart. And they have a, a very good rapport with their, with their clients. And it's funny how that really generates a lot of loyalty. Um, and I, I, see, I see really the whole thing is not just getting the haircut. It's, it's everything else around it, including mental health. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And we've had loads of emails um, from the clients wanting to buy gift vouchers and stuff like that just to help as much as they can. So yes, it could be their way of helping the barber as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we brought something out called Tip Your Barber or Tip, tip your, your Beauty Provider. Um, that, that has worked. I mean, a lot of people had probably a bit of pushback um, initially, but that, that certainly has worked very well in the UK. And last I looked, I think, in the, in the States, I think we've probably generated over $75,000 worth of, of where people have just contributed and help, helped out their barbers. I mean, I had one story from a lady in Atlanta where customer just came out of the blue paid $140 and said listen if I had I come in here every week I would have spent this anyway thinking of you there you go so it was like it's not for everybody but certainly has been well received um, and it's been helping people and I think it's not just actually the financial it's almost the fact that that bit of love and exchange of, of energy again and appreciation can pick you up when you're having a bad day you know yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> yeah well I'm gonna get the second question is the burning question does Booksy expect it's going to be all appointment when we go back? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, just one more feature. We, we're also launching vouchers and gift cards, which I think is going to be out due at the end of this week. Again, so that's just an, an, another one. Um, in terms of when do we think, I think really like the rest of us, we, we're looking at what the government is going to be saying. And I think that's going to dictate 
You have a lot of barbers that do traditional walk-ins and probably will not want to change that. Um, but I think really in today's climate, you're going to see a bit of inertia. There'll be a percentage of, of customers that having been on lockdown and particularly if they're caring or looking after elderly parents and so on, they're going to be very careful about coming back into the public and they're going to be very choosy as to where they go. They're going to get a percentage of that. And I think then uh, it's very important then that um, the, the beauty providers have something in, in place in terms of distancing and PPE and, and all the things that to give the confidence to the general public that it's okay. Um, I think we've seen a, a massive spike uh, since in, in inquiries, people coming out of the woodwork that were traditional walk-in barbers are now realizing that, hey, this is not gonna work. Um, so we're, we're, we're seeing that definitely uh, as, as an increase across the board. Yeah, because yeah, it's a hard one, isn't it? If the government say, for instance, we can open on June the 1st, but you've got to do all appointments and you're not set up for it, it will be, I suppose you just have to have a sign on your door and people tap your door and then you book them in and then send them away and they come back. But Yeah, so you can have probably the lines, like you go outside the co-op and every, I don't know, so many metres, you're standing there with your shopping bag waiting for two people to come up and two can go in. Yeah, that's all right like that, but not waiting for air cut. Yeah, no, but you know, um, I think um, certainly uh, we're going to see many, many changes. I think it's going to become more automated. And, and we see the markets changing anyway, you know, in, in four years, uh, from four years ago in starting the booking system here in the UK, um, you would speak to people and they would, they would pause and they'd think, well, no, nah, I'm a walking barber. What are you in a booking system for? And that's, that's been massive change in four years. So I think uh, certainly with this um, COVID, it's going to put a lot more flexibility and people are going to start thinking that appointment system is, is probably the right way to go. Yeah, I mean, I was reading something where they said even taking cash is going to be looked down upon. Yes, yes. I mean, with, with, with Booksy, you've got the um, in-app ability to be able to pay everything um, through the app. So you don't, you don't, it's a digital trail. You don't have to worry about the, the cash side of things. Um, and uh, that's, that's already been implemented. We have many, many uh, barbershops that actually have it set up. And there's different ways to set it up. But even some of them are actually getting paid when the appointment's been made. Um, or on checkout. So there's different ways to, to do that. And it's, it's helped with cancellations because traditionally when we first started, we, the data was up to 30% can, can result in cancellations. That was mostly in the salon side of business, you know, which is a substantial amount of cancellations. So I think now today with uh, more software packages, there's, there is the courtesy of giving that sort of space and enough time for the, uh, for the owner to find someone else to, uh, to dovetail in to fill that spot. Um, one of the things we have on, on our system is like a waiting list. So again, you can put your name on the waiting list and as one person may cancel for, for legitimate reasons, then they get a notification, fingers on the buzzer. So quite often, you know, you will get feedback from Barbara saying, yeah, that person canceled, but it was filled instantly. So that, you know, we're using really as much technology as possible to facilitate the easy way to go from thinking about it to sitting in that chair. Yeah, yeah, because that's what I was thinking about today, start getting a waiting list. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's go on to your last question. So what's new with Booksy when you return? Well, when we return? Well, um, we can't wait to get back in our offices, but we can't at the moment. <laughs> so we've all been working remotely um, across the board in several different countries um, from home, which has new challenges. Um, but that's what we're looking forward to really getting back together with the team. Um, we've been very, very busy, to be honest. Uh, our customer support is there. And um, anybody, you can imagine a lot of people being crying about their booksy. And now, now they actually have a lot more time on their hands, things that they actually wanted to find out more about the product, how to implement this and the other. They're having a lot more. So our customer support um, team has been very busy. Um, in terms of new, I think I mentioned it with the vouchers. And certainly with the Zoom uh, online, where you can actually book your uh, barber remotely uh, to get some uh, um, advice about grooming. Not to cut your hair and look like Wurzel Gummidge, perhaps, but uh, to give them some confidence. Uh, and, and really just to just catch up. Because as I said, a lot of it is the band, a lot of it is the chat. We're excited about that because we see that bridging. That helps business owners to keep in touch with a database on a more personalized, you know, a posting and Instagram is good, Facebook is good, but there's nothing like speaking to someone and to actually have the video integrated where you can speak to your barber at a booked time as a service. 
um, it's very good. It's gone on well with a few that I've spoken to already. In fact, one of them want to actually just set it up so they can do a contribution to their local NHS because it might only be 10, 15 minutes. There's a lot of charitable things happening. We know with the food banks that it's getting worse. We know there's a lot of support that needs to be out there in the community. So anything we can do to facilitate that, get people speaking, communicating, exchanging that bit of love and respect, then uh, that's a positive thing. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we're excited about that. Yeah, well, yeah, when I spoke, that's what I thought was a good thing. And I didn't know how comfortable I'd be about taking people's money, but I thought if they made a donation to the NHS, I thought that's a brilliant, it's yeah. good touch. Yeah. All right, that's great speaking to you. And we'll speak again in a minute, AD. Thank Next you, up on my list is um, Simon from Dapper Dan. Are you Simon? Hi, right, Mike, you okay? Yeah, I'm good, man. Thanks for doing this today. No um, Simon and I have known each other for a number of years and I've stopped Dapper Dan, oh God, five, six years at least. It's got yeah, back. At least, yeah. So I wanted to bring Simon on today, talk about products, what's happening with products. Is there anything new we're going to be using in the barber shop or anything Dapper Dan are developing? So do you want to introduce yeah. yourself? Just well, sure. Um, my name's Simon. I, um, I'm a, uh, originally a barber of 20 years and I, I, I founded uh, Dapper Dan uh, about six or seven years ago, uh, which is what I do full time now. So, no, t no, you know, no time for for hair cutting anymore for me. But uh, I try and do a little bit every now and again whenever I get the chance. Okie dokie. Right. So, tell us what Dapper Dan is bringing out, or have you got anything coming out to help barbers? Are you doing hand sanitizer or anything, or have you got any other products in the? Um, we're not doing hand sanitizer. I think I'll uh, I'll leave that to literally everybody else um, <laughs> in the world. Uh, so no, we'll not be jumping on that that bandwagon. Um, plus, I'm not not sure there's a fantastic market for it anyway. Um, I'll certainly be using hand sanitizer uh, at work and in, and, and in my barber shop. There'll be there'll be plenty of hand sanitizer there. So it's an important product, but uh, I don't think Dapper Dan's going to be. Uh, taking part in that um, we do have a few existing new products that were due to be launched this year um, one of which is um, just some of the existing popular signing products we're going to be launched in 50 mil sizes um, I'm not sure whether that will happen as fast I'm not sure whether there's a, a requirement for that we don't obviously <clears throat> we don't know what we're going to be going back to so um one thing we do have in the pipeline which could be useful is a uh, a new matte cream which we were developing anyway um and uh, it's all signed off and, and ready to go we're just going through testing and organizing the packaging and uh what's interesting about that is the packaging is going to be a um airless uh pump so that will actually lend itself quite well to any barbers or any any consumers who are quite keen on the uh, the ultra clean hygienic uh, sort of dis dispenser. Okay, yeah, because a mate of mine said the other day, "How are we going to go back with pucks if we're all sticking our hand in the same pucks? Surely it's double dipping contamination." And then was thinking we're going to have to use spatulas, but that makes a sense. That that's got to be the way forward. Is to be a lot more clean would be using like a toothpaste dispenser. Yes, I mean that's obviously not every, not all Dapper Dan products can go into those things, and and other brands will will feel the same. There's, there's, there'll be popular products out there that people still want to use that just can't go into that kind of packaging. But I, you know, I've given it some thought, and I, I believe that if everyone in the barber shops are are doing what they're supposed to do with the hygiene and using the correct PPE. Um, I'm not sure double dipping will be an issue. It could, it could absolutely become an issue, but if everyone's uh, gloving up before cuts, then it should, in theory, be clean hands going into the, uh, into the product. So um, we'll have to wait and see on that one. Um, all Dapper Dan, or all I can say on behalf of Dapper Dan is we're, we're ready to, to see what it brings and and make changes and, and do whatever we need to do to support our uh, our loyal customers. Because it, it's so weird with all of this. It's like we're meant to be doing stuff that we should have been doing before. And whenever I've been teaching, it's like we're shaving. It's always spatula because no double dipping. People just put their hands or their brushes in the pot. 
And then people are like, oh. but this is like what the standards was before, like having clean equipment, all the stuff, wiping down our chairs, making sure people are gowned about the gown touching, stuff we should have been doing anyway. And it's I sort of like... I think um, to pick up on something Helen said um, about, you, you know, it's what we should be doing versus what we probably are doing or, or most barbershops have been doing isn't, you know, there's a disparity there. And uh, Helen mentioned that the, uh, not everyone's combs and brushes are getting, um, you know, sanitized bet between each customer. It's just not feasible or certainly, it's certainly very difficult. But now we're going to be going back to a situation where you absolutely have to. And the first thing I thought of was, uh, you're just going to have to, you're going to have to, have, like you mentioned, it needs to be 10 minutes. So you're going to have to have two sets of equipment, one in, one in the barber side, one being used and keep rotating. That's what, yeah, you know. It's going to go back to when I first got trained, I got trained in a hairdresser's because you couldn't get trained in the barbershop back then, all them years ago. But I, everything that was used got sanitised. So I'd wash the hair for the hairdresser, sit them down, I'd have brand new combs, brushes all laid out for them. And then afterwards, it'd be cleaned down, take it downstairs, sterile it, and then it would go in through like a factory process to be new. Where when I worked in a barbershop, I had such a shock where it was just the same tool getting used again and again and again. And it's gonna, that's going to have to go into place. Absolutely. It's going to yeah. take a lot of time. So the time's the thing. I think every, every barber needs to be, if they're not already, needs to be considering how much they're going to charge and what, what, uh, how much time they're going to need for each client. Certainly if they're already using uh, appointments so they've got the, the tool, um, you know, pop, quite possibly boxy, um, they can start re-evaluating how much time they book out uh, based on what we believe we're going to be going back to, although there's a lot of uncertainty about that. I mean, and, and this is uh, the main reason I wanted to do this, because I've had two friends say to me about they're going to think about dropping their prices, and I'm like, Shannon, don't you dare. But I wanted to do this to get it out to as many barbers as <laughs> I'm not going to put my prices up when I go back because I'd have to change my websites, my door, you know, my signage, everything. And we've all had the grant. So I'm going to use, if there is anything left, what's left of that to, for the PPE and to carry on. But it'd be something that the prices will quite quickly have to go up. Otherwise, I'm not going to be in business. And I think barbers and hairdressers, everyone's just got to see that and be ready for that. But to go back to think, it's 20% off, it's 10% off, because we have got to buy this all in. It will be the law, and we'll just all go bankrupt. There's no point going back if that's the way you're fought. So the thought process for everyone is hold your nerve. You know, you can't just go back and say, oh, I'm an extra fiver now, because you're gonna, you've got to do it in a professional way. But I think that's where that grant helps us. But we've definitely got to think it's got to shoot up when this all comes into place. Absolutely. There's no other way around it. I think putting prices down... Would be, would be crazy. I, I understand the temptation. Everyone's going to be thinking it's going to be some kind of land grab. When, it, when everything reopens, it's quick, try and get the same customers back in. Um, but there's going to be no need. Everyone's going to need a haircut. We're going to struggle, I think, to get everyone in at first, uh, certainly with the amount of ti extra time. So I just don't see why there's any requirement to put prices down. Um, you know, charge, you know, know your worth and charge, charge the right, the right level. Certainly a little bit more possibly to, to justify the PPE. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. I'll get on to your second question I got here for you, which I think we've sort of discussed anyway, but what people didn't know about you, they know you as the man from Dapper Dan, that you've actually got your own barber shop. So will you be going, because I think it's quite a traditional setup. Will you be doing appointments when you go back? Um, well, I was, I was talking, uh, via WhatsApp to, uh, to the staff the other day. All, all my uh, barbers are uh, self-employed. Um, they all really don't like the idea of doing appointments. We are, or we've always been traditional walk-in and it's always worked uh, really well. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we quite possibly need to be, you know, deciding what we're gonna do. They don't want to do appointments, but they might have to. Um, we're obviously gonna wait and see what the, uh, what the government say, I'm, I'm quite ready for them to say it has to be an appointment, you know, no walking services can be available. Um, one idea I did have though, which might be a happy balance for uh, traditional walking barbershops um, to maintain a little bit of what they, they're comfortable with is to book, book the day out in, 
in sort of incremental sittings, so sort of two hour sittings, um, open up as normal. And if, as you fill up, obviously don't, you can't have 15 people waiting like you used to. You might be able to work out that you can have three or four people waiting within a safe space. So um, once you're at a certain level, you can start asking people to come back at the next, you know, within the next two hours. Um, writing people's names down that that could work quite well you could even utilize Boxy or, or a, another facility to um so people can actually book these time slots mm -hmm. they turn up let's say you book at two o'clock you turn up at two you you'll then sit within within that small queue have your hair cut and it allows the barbers to feel like they're not as time pressured per haircut which i think i think is the the biggest sort of shock to the system when you go from walking to appointments is uh, each barber all of a sudden having to clock watch every half an hour or, or what, whatever time they, they book out. It's, it's, it's quite difficult if you're not used to it. So Yeah, I, I agree. I spoke to my staff today and that's the main thing they said is how much time do we get per appointment? And, and it's every barber shop's different and every barber's different. It's just trying to get that agreement. And every haircut's different. So, yep. it's, you know, I'm sure... The people out there who do have been doing appointments for a long time just take it in their stride and and that's that but um we all know if you get a skin fade in you might want to take a bit longer uh, you might already be 10 minutes behind from the last skin fade and it's that it adds a, a certain stress to the day mm -hmm. that if you're not used to it it can it can make the day a lot a lot harder so uh we but all this might be moot anyway because we might absolutely have to do appointments and we're all just gonna have to uh Suck it up and make the change. I know. In, which I, I, case, in which case, I'll be on the phone to uh, to Aidy. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I can't wait until we get some government guidelines. Because that's what I said to my staff today. I was like, as soon as we get some guidelines, I expect to be working fourteen-hour days for at least a week just to get it in place for everyone. And I mean, that's I, it. yeah. I imagine that whatever guidelines, there's a, there'll be a few industries, so, uh, nails and beauty and and obviously hairdressing barbering they'll be able to lump a few different uh sort of sectors into one lot of guidelines but um when we get those guidelines uh, who knows uh, we're all just waiting I, I don't believe it's going to be uh six months like they were talking about the other, the other day I, I don't think they'll push single out our industry and push it back so so drastically um a lot of other countries are, are bringing barbering and hairdressing back within their um, sort of non-essential retail uh, wave of reopening, uh, so we can we can be hopeful that uh, it won't be as bad as was what was talked about last week. Yeah, as always, let's hope and pray not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, my last question for you, Simon, is <clears throat> retail. So, do you think this would be a good opportunity? I mean, we're going to go back. We're pressing the restart button. Is it going to be more of an opportunity to be a lot more professional in the barbershop and start retailing like we should? Yes, absolutely. And it's also, uh, I mean, we, we're we pulling our hair out sometimes with uh, the, the, the variance in, in people's attitude to, um, to retail. Some, some barbershops are fantastic at it and, and really enjoy it and embrace that side of what they do. And they really see it as a way of, 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 uh, of adding to the, the revenue. Um, because it's easy you've got you've got a captive audience someone's in that chair anyway so if you can sell them a product it's no extra outlay it's just more profit um, but a lot of barbershops see it as you know we've all heard barbers say oh, I'm not a salesman I'm a barber they're just they're too busy and they don't want to engage with it um, going back uh, after this we're expecting it to be even more time with the client because of the new measures and the new uh, with with all the PPE and the uh, the sanitation measures we're going to have to take. Um, it's even more of an opportunity. And if barbershops are nervous about putting their prices up, but they're going to have to take longer per haircut, um, selling products is a good way to maintain their profit margin per haircut. Um, not everyone will buy one, but certainly a little bit of effort. Uh, and, and uh, enthusiasm towards the product they're using on the hair um, all of a sudden it's incredible how many more products can be sold so I do think this is a good opportunity um, certainly for the ones who haven't really engaged with retail too much in the past yeah I completely agree I think 
you know, this is awful what's happening, but it does press the restart button. And I do think it's going to make our industry a lot more professional. Well, yeah, ho hopefully. Um, it's uncertain times, but, uh, we, you know, I think everyone's ready and ready to get back and uh, yeah, see what we can make of it. And like, like you say, as soon as we get a little bit more clarity, we can all start making much firmer plans. Um, and hopefully it won't be too, uh, won't be too bad. Cool. All right, and Simon, thank you for that. That was brilliant. Now, last but not least, my good friend, Gareth Clark, who I do training with at the Great British Barbering Academy. We've worked together six, seven years training, Gareth. Yep, so yep. that. And I wanted Gareth on because he employs staff. I self-employ my barbers like Simon does. And he'd just have another outlook as a good business owner with employing staff to what he feels it's going to be like coming back. So, Gareth, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yep. Um, my name is Gareth Clark, obviously. I've been a barber for about 32 years now. So, my entire life has just been dedicated to barbering. Um, we've had our own barber shop for the last 16 years and just seen it going from strength to strength now. So, we are, I think we're a little bit ahead of the game at the moment. We've already got like a booking system in place. You know, we're employing staff and I think we're, you know, we're probably a little bit ahead of the game at the moment because we're making plans for the future already. So, yeah, and as Mike said, you know, I'm an educator with the Great British Barbering Academy. And you've got quite a few people probably seen me around the show scene as well. Right, then, my first question for you is, I did ask this question on another one of these chats and it got a little bit shot down because I think people just thought I was trying to profiteer from education, which I wasn't. Oh, i got to say that. <laughs> it's one thing I thought of, do you think we're going to go back to the old days and need apprentices? Well, we've always employed apprentices. So quite a few members of our staff have come through the French system. So we're a complete believer in that system. And yeah, I, I completely see that you are going to need an apprentice when you go back to the barbershop because we're going to be busy. We're going to be, our time's going to be taken up and we're going to need people to keep us going in between the haircuts. Well, no, that's what I'm, I'm thinking either 10 minutes we spend cleaning our tools or 10 minutes the apprentice does exactly that. Work. Exactly that. Everything's going to have to be sanitised in between. Clippers are going to have to be cleaned down in between. We're going to need a couple of sets of combs and stuff like that. Brushes. We're going to be using brushes on people, even the products and stuff like that. If we are going to spatulas and stuff like that, that's got all to be to hand. You know, the chairs have got to be cleaned down in between. Payments have got to be taken as well. You know, the whole cashless thing is quite debatable at the moment, but I can see it happening. I can see prepayments come in and just contactless payments through the barbershop as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and that was my question, because I, I do think it's a good opportunity for youngsters that are all leaving school at the moment. But I do think, well, it makes more sense to have an apprentice. You've got barbers for the future and to get them doing all these jobs that we're going to have to do. Otherwise, it's just going to take time out of the barber. I completely agree with it. We, we've always had an apprentice, and that apprentice then knows your work practice from day one. They come straight into your barber shop. They know how you work. They work exactly the same way. You know the standard of work as well. You know, it's just repeating what you do continuously. You know, there's, there's young people out there this summer are going to need a job, and you know, we will be looking to take an apprentice absolutely 100% behind it. Yeah, definitely. Right, this is going to be quite a question to take you back, but say we go back to work in June, so the government gives us the date, and with my staff, they're self-employed, so I'm going to have to say to them, are you coming back? Because some people have still got that fear. They won't want to come back. But as you employ your staff, what do you say to them if they say, no, I'm not coming back, Gareth? Funny enough, I spoke to our accountant yesterday and the advice we've got given on that is because our staff are furloughed at the moment, how long does the furlough payment keep going? You know, with, they're talking about at the moment, it's the end of June. So to that point, if we open up before June, if, they're, if they don't feel comfortable coming back, we can keep them on the furlough system. So that will cover us that way. But if they ask the that, if they're not comfortable about coming back, because we're employing, then the employment might come in. And obviously, we will then be having a discussion about non-payments to them. So 
it's a bit of a tricky one, but that's the advantage of employing people. And we've always employed people and we've seen it as a bit of a security blanket type thing. So we can have a little bit of control about what they're doing. You know, there is this debate about self-employment, over-employment at the moment. I'm in favour of employment. I prefer it. And I think for what's happened at the moment, the government has helped us out as a business. We've got our government grant. We've just got our furlough payment through today as well. So we're almost in quite a secure position at the moment. And, you know, that money that they're giving us is being used to support the business. And when we go back, that biz money will be used to support the business reopening as well. Because the investment that we're going to have to have more of when we go back. But I think one of the biggest reassurances the staff are looking for is the fact that we are going to be looking after them. The simple fact of have we got the correct PPE? Have we got the correct sanitization in place? Have we got the appointment system in place? Are the clients going to be aware of it? And we are talking about this at the moment. We're talking about having all those points covered so when we do return, they can come back and feel comfortable about being in that work environment. If they're still not feeling comfortable about that work environment, um, I don't know what we can do then. Yeah, well, to be fair, the self-employed people are still getting 80% of their money paid to them. And, the, you know, everyone will have the PPE in place. It's just that with self-employed, if they don't come back, then they don't get paid. But with employed, it's not like... Because it, it's, it's that, to me, it's that argument that I can understand if someone didn't want to come back. Yeah. But I, I can understand from your point of view that, well, you're employed, you've got to come back. Yeah, it's, it is a case of you know, we're employing them and then, you know, it is a case of they're coming back. But you've got to take their, their welfare into consideration as well. They're not comfortable. So, so we, you know, I understand both points of view. But yeah. it's, it's sort of easier from mine and Simon's point of view because if they don't want to come back because their mental health, they've got asthma or something, then it's like, okay, okay, okay. But I haven't got to fill in loads of forms and try and claim money or where do they get money? You know, that's their decision. But if, was, if they were employed, it's just that, that decision. Yeah, it's almost the same as quite final facts, you know, we're opening back up, you've got to come back. But no, it isn't that. You've got to take their welfare into consideration as well. You know, are we going to be limited on the hours when we go back? You know, the social distancing is going to have to be taken into place. There's things that we're talking about at the moment as well, what we want to put in place, like... We've got five barbers chairs. We're gonna, we've got to do split shifts. We've got our gaps in between. You know, all this has got to be put into place. And this is what we've got to talk about to, to reassure the staff that our working environment is a comfortable and safe working environment. Yeah, but it's it's never. We've got to say it's never going to be a hundred percent. If we're you know, person on person, it, unless we come in like we're going to do open heart surgery. It's never going to be one hundred percent, is it? Let's, we've got to get real with it, but we've got to get back to work at some point. Let's get let's get real. So. Exactly. I think the trouble is what's happening at the moment. There's an awful lot of barbers out there, self-employed or employed, being paid to be sat at home, eight percent pay in the sunshine, getting a nice suntan at the moment. So what what is the incentive to get back to work? You know, it, there isn't an incentive at the moment, and that, you've got that's what I'm trying to say is that we've got to think of the welfare side of it to make it a comfortable place for them to get back into it. I, I, yeah, and I think that's why this group here is a good discussion group because it's given these points of view which I think people need to hear. I think we need to make a plan in place for getting back exactly. and, what, you know, and what's going to be expected because like Simon said we, this industry cannot just stop for six months. That would be ridiculous. I think a lot of us would be uh, saying goodbye to our businesses wouldn't we if we'd have to close it for six months because a lot of people haven't saved for that rainy day, have they? No, no. It will, it will cripple the economy. Exactly. But, so the, the last question I had that where you started answering, which was great, was what do you think we will have to have in place? Uh, yeah, obviously the PPE side of it, sanitize, sanitization side of it is going to be uh, right up on the top of the list, isn't it? Social distancing is the one rule in, but there's no government guidelines at the moment. It's all speculation. You know, we have conversations quite often, Mike, about do you think it'd be this, do you think it'd be that? We need to look at other countries that are going back at the moment. The Danes are going back, the Germans are close as well, aren't they? And I think the Italians are going to be fairly soon as well. What are they putting into place? How are they working? Are they wearing face shields? Are they having the face masks? 
my biggest worry to me is the disposable gown side of it. How do we cope with that side of it? Because that is just going to be massive. Like you touched on earlier, 20 clients a day. We can't have 20 gowns in the shop per barber working. We're looking 60 plus, 80 plus gowns a day. That's just ridiculous. It's, that's it's, just, that. it's the environmental factor because if you're washing all of that, that's not good for the environment. No, and if you're throwing all that plastic away, that's not good for the environment exactly. either. They, no, they exactly that. That into it. You're seeing barber shops and hairdressers going green and environmentally friendly at the moment. How can we do that when we're disposing 60 gowns a day? Yeah, and we've got three pairs of gloves a day, 60 face masks a day, which, you know, it, it's just, it's going to be absolutely huge. And these, they're costs that we're going to have to tailor into what we're doing when we go back. You know, if it's a pair of gloves, if it's a face mask, if it's a face shield, if it's clothing, a uniform that you've got to wear as well, because this is one of the things that we're touching on the moment. We're not going to go down the route of scrubs like a doctor or a dentist and stuff like that. But what we are looking at doing is supplying a uniform that they come to work in, they wear it at work, when they finish the day's work, they take it off at work, bag it up, take it home and wash it straight away. Because that is contaminated clothing, which you know apparently is COVID-19 is living on hair, isn't it? But, but uh, to me though, if it's this strict, does a haircut really mean that much? Would they just say you're staying shut? I think there's got to be a realism of, well, if we're going back, it can't be like that. It would be like, you know, I, I don't know. It's, I mean, I ain't got a lot of hair to talk about, but I'd rather just shave my hair off myself. And that's me talking, and it's my business is barbering. Then I would have to go like it was a military operation. I, I don't think it's going to be a military operation. I think it's just a case of you've got to have guidelines that we've got to follow. Washing your hands regular, using sanitizer. That you need oh yeah, to I use. think without, without saying we're going to wash our hands. Use wash your hands before the cut, wash your hands after the cut. Yeah. Sanitizer, clean tools, clean chair, gowned up properly, barbicide. But I think that's where it stops. I, I'm, yeah, I, think, I, 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 did, I, I might be completely wrong. Two meters apart, appointments. But I, I'm surely we can't be. Where you know, I can't cut someone's hair if they've got if they've got glasses on. I think what you got to remember them. Take them off, don't they? I think what you got to remember as well. We are around the back of the client, and you know. Yeah. We we do we need that face that face shield on? There might be a possibility that we'll be wearing a face mask for a small amount of time, but we are around the back of the client. You just got to look at the services you're doing. Don't do beards. Don't do shaving. Yeah, no beards. They don't want any contact with the face whatsoever. So just forget doing those services. For a period of time until we we we'll get back to where we'll all over be normality. Yeah, well, I don't know. It's, it is quite scary because I think everyone's got their own thoughts, like which is quite clear today. Yeah, of how it is. But the the burning question where I want us all to sort of have a group discussion over this all is when do you think we'll be coming back? See, I I think June the first. I'll put it out there. Um. To me, I think because they've extended the furlough and the self-employment payments to the end of June, I think we're definitely not going to be working in May and June sometime, I think. Guys? I think it'll be a, a, a slow return. So I think you'll see some release beginning of June to certain um, services. I think barbering and, and hairdressing and beauty will be longer than that. As you say, Gareth, you know, because they've... Um, up to the schemes until the end of June, I can really see that you'll probably get the nod mid June, unless anything changes to open up beginning of July. I totally agree with that. It's very interesting because um, we know with the 50 states in, in, in America, you've got Atlanta that opened up on Friday. They got a population of 10.9 million. I should imagine probably about 50% have opened up. The other 50% think, no, I'm going to sit back and sit it out what will happen in the next four to six weeks the data will start to filter through and that's going to govern a lot on how other states and how how we perhaps will work over here wiz air has opened up for business there was some talk about having to make the middle seat empty but i don't think the government wants to pay for the for the, for the middle seat but what what you you can go on any app now and you can see the planes are beginning to fly so if you can sit in a plane for four or five hours mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, 45 minutes. I think mother's the, uh, they said uh, necessity is the mother of invention. 
I think I think barbers that are actually thinking outside of the box now and 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 getting prepared like you guys have been saying mentally will work away. Um, I just went on the uh, just to find out what it's like to you know for barbers in the nineteen late forties. Uh, I'll send you this picture. Uh, it's in the Blitz. Uh, where you have buildings falling on one side and the barber turned up with a big chalkboard and he says, right, never mind the, the blasted, blown out windows. We're ready now, walk in the welcome. And I think, I think that's the spirit. And I think a lot of it's to do with really how you approach it. You've got to have the government guidelines. But if you're going in there half cocked, think that it's never going to work and then you, you, you're, going to, you're almost going to fulfill your own prophecy. I think it's a way of how to, to, to actually get yourself geared up mentally and, and think of the practical ways in which you can still conduct business. And, and at the end of the day, it's the consumer that's going to drive this. The consumers are the ones that's going to tell us what they want. And it always has been and always will be. And I think really the, 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 the shops that are actually taking uh, very good preparations, they're doing their marketing, they're letting their database know this is how they're going to be running it according to government guidelines. It could be something as simple as, guys, bring your mask with you. If not, then there's a mask here for sale. And this idea of actually barbers putting their prices down is absolutely crazy. If anything, the price is going to start to go up if you want to give that type of all-round protective service. Uh, it might only be for six months. But like everything else, once prices go up, they never seem to go down, do they? Um, but I think supply and demand, people are going to want to have good care good service in a cleanly situation and i think that's that's the secret really and we, we'll learn as we go along yeah i agree i think we'll take guidance from the other european countries and if they've gone back and it's okay we will but none of them i don't know i mean shoot me down here norway and denmark are back but none of them have got seriously too much you know the british master barber's done something which i thought was really good but it was way over what any other countries asked to go back into the barber shop so I think we will follow the guidelines of the other European countries when they go back. Yeah, no, I, to I totally agree with that, Mike. Do you guys have any thought about um, yourselves, your safety in touching hair? With the fact that COVID has been, you know, can be live on hair, are you going to say we want to wash hair when it comes in? Do you think that's a, a good point, bad point? Because obviously barbers normally don't. Obviously, you know, I'm used to going to hairdresser, not a barber. But it's something I've been wondering whether that's something that bothers you guys as barbers. I um, think it's, it'd be on their skin anyway. So I think if you wash it, it's still going to be there. I think washing your hands before and after would be the, be the thing that, that you, you sort of have to do. And I just think it's just going to be a minimisation thing of keeping the distance, having appointments, only having one in the waiting area and it will just be, it's just, I don't think nothing's going to be risk free, but it's cutting that <laughs> risk right down. And that's the way I see it. I, 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 it's not going to be a hundred percent thing. Otherwise we all might, might as well shut the doors now. But I, you know, I, I just think being clean and keeping it, you know, not in, not, not, not back to normal and, oh, I'll sweep that up in a minute. Quick next, I'm busy. That won't happen. But it's just, I don't know, looking after yourself and looking after the client. And I think they expect that as well. I, I think possibly uh, certainly the, the barbers that do appointments can, can start, because they can quite easily message all their regular customers. They can, they can ask people to arrive with clean hair mm. and, uh, <laughs> and then not, they don't need, to, um, don't need to wash. I was discussing this with, with uh, my barbers the other day about whether we, we do wash everyone's hair, just as a matter, okay. a matter of course. But... Um, I was discussing with them whether the pros and cons, because obviously you wash their hair, you're going to feel like the hair's cleaner, but uh, you're then spending more time with the client, um, and 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 they're they're reclined having their hair washed. There's more chance of you know. So uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure where. What well, I think it's fifty fifty. Really, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe getting people to wash their own hair before coming is the answer to that one. Mm -hmm. Let me jump in then. Um, I think I would say, obviously, sanitization and cleanliness is going to be the key factor when we go back. You know, that the customers are going to be voting with their feet. They're going to let us know. They're going to go to the places they're going to be comfortable with. We've all been to supermarkets recently, and there's are some supermarkets out there who are not following most of the government guidelines. 
you know, you go in there, there's 10 people down an aisle and barging past you, staff, no PPE PE on and stuff. You know, it's happening at the moment. You've got to look at your client base and I think they will tell you if they feel comfortable with you or not. And if you are following the right practices of what should be in the normal standards anyway, the PPE, sanitization, cleanliness, cleaning the chairs down, cleaning the barbershop down in between. You know, we're talking about split shifts in a barbershop to cover the day. You know, we're looking at 12 to 14 hour days, splitting it down the middle, locking up in between the shifts so it doesn't have um, too many people in the building. You know, limiting the numbers that have been sat in there as well. Because we do all something similar to the Booksy app already, we're using something else, we can contact the clients before. We can, come, we can send out a mass email to every single client of ours, 5,000 of whatever it is out there. We can get that information to them before we start trading. And we can send that information to them on a daily business, a daily routine if we needed to, so they know what they should be coming into mm-hmm. us. And we got raised a question with one of our members of staff about what if someone comes into the barbershop showing symptoms of them? Just refuse them. They're still about naive about coming to get their hair cut. Just refuse them. No different to refusing a kid with nits, is it? Yeah, and it'd be, it'd be good with the booking apps as well if there was a text that morning where we could say, you've got your appointment at this time, and if you don't feel well, please tell us now and yeah. don't, 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 don't turn up. I think what you've got to remember, a lot of the public have been quite educated for these last six weeks. You know, if they're still going around doing their business, as we know, as we know, some of the barbers are still working as well. You know, we've still got barbers out there working at the moment, going to do mobile haircuts and stuff like that. That's the name of shame to get them into trouble because we're the ones that are doing things properly at the moment and we should be doing things properly when we go back as well. Yeah, definitely. And, and, I, and I really think like that. I think that it's like when the no smoking come in, everyone said, oh, that's not going to happen in France and England. And it did overnight. And when they said social distance, okay, they, all they need is 75% of people to adhere to the lockdown. And it's, it's only like 98% of people are. So once they put the guidelines in, I think 98% of the barbershops will, and most of the public will. So it will just change our lives forever. I think one of the big things that can come out of this is we're going to be in a very strong position when we return because one of the things that we didn't, you know, we're not recognised, we're not, you know, we're not seen by the government as a high risk industry. Perhaps we will be now when we go back because of the contact we're going to have with people. You know, perhaps this is a time for us to stand together and pull something together to get, to get something in place to make the barbering industry a bit stronger and, you know, a better industry and something that is more recognised for what we do. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there recognising what we do now because of the dodgy haircuts they're getting at home. Yeah, but don't you notice when um, the Americans talk, they say, and the barber shops, they mention barbers quite a bit. When the English, British, sorry, politicians talk, they say hairdressers and the hairdressers and beauty salons. And that really annoys me that we don't even get a mention and we need to start getting, you know, like in America and they say the hairdressers and the barber shops and the beauty, but we're still not getting, and I just think we might get lumped in with the hairdressers that do appointments anyway and have sort of got a bit of a different service. And people need to start talking that barbershops is separate from hairdressing. And I think that's always been a problem with our industry. We just get lumped in so that they can start seeing us as a separate entity, which we are. So we don't want to be lumped in with a set of rules with hairdressers. When we, we do run a different business. Yeah, but we, we both know ourselves, Mike, from an education point side of things, you know, government standards, MVQ levels and stuff like that. It's, you know, we, they try and to lump us in with the hairdressers because we are doing a completely different job to them. So, you know, we need to be recognised for what we do. And I'm, I'm pretty sure the public are starting to recognise what we do at the moment. Yeah. Because, you know, they're not getting the service. They're not getting the... It's not just about the service, is it? I think AD touched on it earlier about the mental health side of things, having a chat to someone. You know, even from my own point of view, I quite look forward to having a chat with someone now because I'm spending a lot of time on my own at the moment. It's, you know, you, we have that contact with people. It's quite an important thing we do as a, as a service. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of people say about the pubs being sociable, but I think it's proved that barbershops are more sociable because people are talking about their barbers more than they are the local down the, you know, down the village or whatever. 
Yeah, but there was, there was something come out recently, wasn't it? The barbershops shutting in the high streets. You know, barbershops, they, we all moan about barbershops opening up on every street corner at the moment, but why, whatever strong business is out there at the moment on the high street. Yeah, where people can communicate. They can communicate in it. Gyms are one of the most big social centres at the moment. And how, how's the gymnasium going to open up afterwards? Yeah. Well, what, we, what we've seen already is the amount of Pilates instructors that would work in several different locations Monday to Friday. They've just turned on the big screen. They're doing it in their front room. And all of their members are just logging in. And you do it from the comfort of your home. Um, I was speaking to another chap who, who is working in the grain business for flour. And he was saying that it's, it's like normally he's on the M25 and one all the way over the place doing appointments. He said since lockdown, he's got through a lot more of his appointments just by one to one. And he, he doesn't think it's going to change. He thinks a lot of customers are going to end up with the online side. So certainly in terms of um, helping people out remotely and selling up products, I can see a lot more business online moving forward. Yeah, like things like this, this, this Zoom has changed everything. I'm going to be doing demos for my students over Zoom, even when we are back. And we have standardisation meetings for education. That's it. There's no more grabbing all the guys from Basingstoke and Southampton to come to pool for an evening. This is it now. This, and it was right under my nose. So that's the sort of good side that's come out of this. And even though I use a PT, you would think so. But I zoomed into her yesterday and she uh, took me around my paces in the garden. But I think, actually, if the summer stays like this, this might be the way forward. You know, it saved me having to go to the gym and stuff like that. It's just booked it and we can, it's any time's free then. I think it's Go on, Helen. Sorry, I think digital is going to be um, the way forward 100%. You know, we're going to see less travel, which I think is a good thing in a way. Yeah, definitely. I, I think Mike said as well that hitting that massive reset button at the moment, you know, these last few weeks, you know, we've all been outside. Like I, I joked about it, we're getting suntans and relaxing and having a cold beer in the evening or a nice gin in the evening. You know, we're all doing it. We're all enjoying ourselves at the moment. Hopefully we're all completely refreshed and completely refocused for when we do return. Cool. Yeah. Right. I, I want to... Call it a day if that's all right with you guys. I think we've covered everything we wanted to cover. Yeah, Is there cool. anything else that anyone else wants to add? No. No, no just uh, thank you very much for inviting us. And um, power to, the, to all of you and all of your lovely customers. I think we're living in excited times. And I think that we're going to look back at this period of time in 10 or 15 years' time. And we'll have some very interesting stories to tell. <laughs> our grandchildren. Let's be there to, 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 to make it happen. How do you Most of it will be recorded as well. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> That's third, you bad. No, that was brilliant, guys. And I do think with the collection of people we've got here, we've got everything covered. So thank you guys so much for taking part in this. No problem. Thanks, Mike. Cheers, guys. Cheers, guys. Thank you.